Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Mike Shea again, Transworld Business Advisors. And today I'm doing a conversation with um, CPA Matt Bell and attorney Ken Gluckman. Both are gentlemen that I have been working with for close to 20 years. Um, well known in Central Florida. Ken does um, probably the lion's share of the business transactions and then does uh, sell side and buy side representation in Main Street and business sales. I don't think you litigate a ton, do you? Not anymore. I used okay. to, but uh, try to stay away from that if I can. Yeah. And then Matt um, owns a pretty big CPA firm, born and raised in Central Florida. I think now we got what, four offices or just three? We have five offices now. Oh, five. Okay. So <laughs> ranging from, uh, I know you got Lakeland. Yeah. Lake so we have Lakeland, Lake Wales. We have Auburndale. We have Kissimmee. And now we have an office in Longwood as well. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. So the reason I, and I told these guys before I started this, the reason I wanted to get them both on specifically was to talk about due diligence. And, and I think, in both prior videos with both with both of these guys, we've talked about it at a 10,000 foot perspective, but the reason it's popped up again is for some weird reason, I've been getting due diligence lists and requests that are kind of like a sledgehammer to kill an, an ant um, and vice versa, where parties aren't asking the right questions. So Ken, let's start with you. Um, so at a main street deal versus a, uh, a traditional M and A deal. What what does due diligence look like from five thousand feet? Well, you know, in a, in a Main Street deal, you've got a much more streamlined process. You don't need the fifteen page uh, detailed list of items. You really need to look at uh, what that specific business, uh, you know, how they operate and and what makes sense for them. What kind of contracts do they have? Are they in an industry that requires contracts uh, with their customers, or do they have uh, you know, more of a, a retail pay-as-you-go type relationship? And are they regulated by uh, different government entities beyond just a, a license or do they have other issues they have to look at? Sure. And at the, at the you know, the big deal, the, what we would consider M&A type transaction, mm -hmm. what, what does due diligence look like there? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned the, the 15 page uh, list we've got are 15 points that touch on really every different aspect of the business we want to know about. Uh, you know, contracts, employee relations. Uh, and, and again, it really depends on whether it's a highly regulated industry or whether it's more uh, consumer oriented or, or what kind of uh, transactions they would have. But really being able to dig in under the cover, spending a lot more time going through all of the historical documents of the company uh, to look at their relations, both internal and external, to understand from a legal standpoint, what are the risks and wh what have they done to alleviate risks? What kind of lawsuits have they had to deal with and uh, employee issues and things of that nature? All right. So for example, um, one that we were just talking about where employee classification 1099 versus W2, we've had that pop up several right. times. Um, why does Why does the buyer or the buyer's counsel ask that question? Uh, it's a huge potential issue. You were talking about risk. Uh, I, I previously was involved in a large uh, telecommunications company spinoff, and there was uh, actually multiple tiers to it. When they did an initial spinoff, they held on to the uh, 1099s, and the new company uh, that they had spun off didn't have 1099s for their employees. So when the IRS came in with an audit, uh, they were tagged for millions of dollars of damages and they had to basically just pony up on it and uh, negotiate as best they could and move on. So then when they did the next spinoff, they actually had uh, many lawyers come in. I was part of a team, this is many years ago, um, where we went in and, and made sure that all of the employees were rebadged with new 1099s uh, to prevent that issue. Even though the prior company could have just assigned the, the 1099s over, they were worried about the risk uh, with any of those employees. So it, it's a huge potential for huge companies. It's less of a potential issue for smaller companies, but is a requirement that you have 1099s for all of your employees. And so that's a, a risk you want to make sure when you're buying that company, that they have all those 1099s for their past history. Uh, and that if you're doing an asset purchase and you're pulling all those employees over to a new company, you've got it lined up to do new 1099s and really onboard those employees 
uh, as new employees and, and understand that that's going to be a part of the process for the acquisition. So you, you, I counted how many times you said risk and it was like mm -hmm. a dozen. Um, yeah. Legal due diligence is very much about risk and it's and the extent of legal due diligence dependent upon size kind of has a drives risk up or down. Um, and with experience, you know where, where issues are. So, you know, for example, you and I are working on a transaction now where we know there might have been some risk. I, you know, when I met the guy, 1099, that came right up out of the box because we've seen it before. And we know, mm -hmm. it, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a CPA, but I know just enough about what compliance is and are you in compliance with the law of reference 1099 versus W-2. So buyers are looking at, at risk and when they're engaging legal due diligence. That, that's kind of the summary. And your counsel needs to have experience knowing what's a risk and what's not within reason. Fair to say. Right. When you're talking about 1099s versus employees, and you've got to have uh, you know separate contracts in place. And, and uh, you really need to be careful with 1099s that you're not uh, you know, doing a 1099 with an individual is is, is much more risky uh, than doing it with a company. And so right. trying to get uh, contractors to incorporate, create some kind of entity and, and use that for your interaction is important. So you want to check and make sure that was done. Right. But the point of the, what I was saying is that, you know, why, why you engage, a, engage counsel and due diligence to do, perform a certain scope of work on legal due diligence is all about mitigating risk. Right. And then Matt's world is, a, is that plus are the numbers doing what they're saying. So Matt, that's kind of a segue into you. Yeah. Same question. Main Street due diligence versus, you know, M&A due diligence. What's it look like? Yeah. So, you know, the one thing that I think a lot of CPAs get tied up in and, and also people that are looking to buy businesses is they, you know, kind of like we talked about, they they get on the Internet and then they decide, hey, list that I found on, on Google and it's got, you know, a hundred questions, a hundred different things they're going to look at. And I've been through transactions where something like that was necessary on a really, really large company, but 99% of the time, the majority of questions that come up on those due diligence engagements are not really pertinent to the business at hand. And so, you know, I think that, um, what we look at when we're doing a main street due diligence is more of a, what I'd call a, I, I guess the word I'm looking for is just a common sense approach to performing due diligence. So, you know, if we're talking about a pizza shop, for instance, we're not going to need to go through a due diligence on a publicly traded company, that type of checklist. We're going to go in there and what we generally do is we'll talk with the person who's looking to buy the business and say, what are your concerns? You know, looking at this business and a lot of these folks have maybe had businesses in the past, so they understand kind of what some of the risks are and then we'll come in as well and say okay this is good you know what you're what you're concerned about but we have maybe a few other items we're going to look at and so you want to get I guess a reasonable basis where you're comfortable but you also have to realize that you know the more you're digging into these companies the more expensive the due diligence gets so if you're looking at a hundred thousand dollar business you're looking to buy you don't want to go spend twenty five thousand dollars for due diligence you want to come up to a reasonable basis where you feel comfortable enough that hey i think this thing is where it needs to be and then you move forward with it yeah so while you're so ken we've seen a legal fee on due diligence with a deal we did that was a quarter million dollars mm -hmm. a quarter million dollars and it was insane and um yeah. Unnecessary. It was literally the, the textbook case of running up the bill. Um, and then conversely, I think Ken or Matt, what I would call what you got, what, what a, when someone's looking at Main Street, they, a good CPA is doing what I call the sniff check. Does it make yeah. sense? Because financial due diligence, like audited statements, and I, get, I got a request the other day for audited statements on a $300,000 restaurant. And I'm like, okay, who's going to pay for that? Well, the seller should have it. I'm like, yeah, then the business doesn't make money anymore because they don't know yeah. what audited statements are. They make assumptions. Um, so a part of it is, you know, knowing what's reasonable. And there's a fear factor that they don't know what to ask. So they always ask for more. But there's, yeah. a, there's a consequence in my world because 
that sends a signal. If you ask for a ridiculous list, it makes an impression upon me and it makes an impression upon the seller and it makes an impression upon you know, the seller's counsel and the seller's attorney accountant about, oh God, we're going to yeah. be dealing with a nightmare here because this person's asking stupid questions. They're not really smart about running this business. So if you're holding paper, right? Hey, you've got to deal with the seller's going to hold paper and you're asking dumb questions. I'm not sure you're competent to run the deal, even operate and pay me back when on the, on the money I'm extending. So buyers need to understand get educated, hire proper counsel, proper attorneys, you know, and accountants who know what's reasonable, what's not, and let them do their job and then address your fears and concerns. But don't overplay your hand because there's a consequence to that in, in the goodwill and the mind of the seller and you get that worse terms. I see that regularly every day. They overplay out of fear when they could have just at, hired the right people and gotten good questions asked. So what, what about on the M&A side? What's that look like? Is that for me? Yeah, for you, like an M and A, a traditional, you know, a million dollars EBITDA. There's a private equity involved. You know, you're hired to do due diligence. How long does that take? What's going to be? What are the documents we're going to request? What are we going to see? Just top line. Yeah, something like that. I mean, I've seen due diligence extend out six weeks on some of those. To be honest with you, because there's such a huge uh, request, you know, piles of information that these these companies are wanting to see. We had a client who. I was on kind of the other side of the transaction where they were merging in with a it was a private equity fund out of New York, property management company in Florida, multi multi million dollar deal, and they were using a firm out of New York that was pretty reasonable size. I think they had maybe a hundred CPAs, so decent sized firm up there, and the initial volley that they came in with was you know this list we're talking about that's you know, multiple pages long and requesting things that I think don't really make a whole lot of sense, even in the property management business. So, you know, you're going to get into <clears throat> when you're in those type of deals, of course, a lot more in-depth view of the transactions, but it all still comes back to a common sense approach. So even that large deal, when we had this huge list of questions and document requests that were coming from the CPA firm, one thing I kind of found out is, you know, I've been doing this for a while, I've been in public accounting for 25 years and handling these type of transactions. And I realized that the person who is sending this was a junior accountant, had never actually done a due diligence before. So they were doing exactly what you were saying, Mike. They pulled a list out of, you know, a, a, we have a practitioner guide, PPC guide, tells you, you know, the list you need to have to do due diligence. That's where they were getting it from because I've seen it. And once I saw the list, even on that large transaction, I, I actually called a meeting with the junior accountant and their supervisor and said, look, you know, I know where this is coming from. Can we just have a meeting of the minds here and actually come back to a reasonable basis about what we're looking at? And and we did. We, we worked out a deal, got the deal done across the line, looked at the things that were important to a property management company, because I, I understand the inner workings. Right. Right actually what to look at yeah what what they wanted you knew how to give them right and it, like in that industry it's always um the escrow accounts a question like because it doesn't flow the way general accounting principles flow you have this third bank account and ken's dealt with it too we've all dealt with that so but those buyers have never done it before so they don't know what questions to ask so they ask everything um yep. talk a little bit about what quality of earnings what that quality of earnings report is and how that works in that process. Yeah. So are you, are you talking about like a private owner? equity? So you know how the private equity, the, they hire the accountant, they collect all the data and then the accountant does this quality of earnings report. So, you know, seller makes a representation based upon X, the broker takes it to market based upon X. You're yeah. hired to come in and look and you basically go. So that you do the same thing at main street. You just, yeah. you know, in, in, the, in, in M and A transaction, that's another fee, right? So the buyer's paying an outside accounting firm to vet the business, in addition to the internal accountants who are doing their own, you know, due diligence. There's this quality of earnings report, but it's third party that says yes, it's doing it or no, it's not doing it. And that's not yeah. cheap either. No, it's not. And you know, that's something that, again, depending on what size of business you're looking at, you know, is that something you'd want to go out and get and request? I mean, I think in a large transaction, yeah, that may be something that you would want to go out and, 
you know, have a third party verify. You're, you're looking at more of a common sense approach to what, what the business is worth. But again, I think in the majority of transactions that you and I deal with and probably can on a regular basis, that isn't something that we're going to need to go out and do. I mean, I, I get a lot, this is kind of off topic, but I get a lot of requests from people for preparing a business valuation. And so if you go to a CPA firm that just does business valuations, they're going to come back with, you know, a prescribed form, different methods where they come up with it. Sometimes those match up with reality. A lot of times they don't. So when someone comes to me and they say, well, what do you think my business is worth? Do I want to go out and hire a firm to do a business valuation? Honestly, a lot of times I refer them back to the brokers and I say, look, you need to talk with these guys, somebody like Mike that is actually in the trenches and knows what businesses are selling for right now, because that number it's can a, change. Between, yeah, it's a question of purpose. It's a question of yeah. purpose, right? And and same thing is like, okay, the way Matt prepares an evaluation depends upon the purpose of it. Is it, do you want to know what the market's doing? Then you call the broker. But um, Ken, I got a question for you. As a, you know, a lot of times I'm kicking seller representation to you. Um, what's that like, that legal back and forth on, on legal due diligence? And what does that look like repping, repping the seller? Well, you know, it's a lot of, uh, really on both sides, just you know, trying to be common sense as far as what we look at. But there are certainly are times with the sellers, depending on the industry they're in or how big they are, uh, that, that I think it can be really helpful. And, and we often have conversations of saying, okay, you know, what what are your contract? What kind of contracts do you have? What are your your uh, legal situation? What, what is your legal situation? Have you got any workers' comp claims? Have you got any uh, litigation out there? Have you got things that you're worried about? Uh, how difficult is it going to be to transition uh, your contracts and your business over to a new buyer? Depending on whether it's uh, a stock sale or an asset sale, and which would be better under the circumstances of of that industry or that specific business. And so it, it can be very helpful. We often have conversations about uh, how can the seller not only get their books cleaned up to be ready to sell, but also to have their legal areas cleaned up and ready to sell. You know, is there yeah. is there a possibility of settling that lawsuit and getting it to go away before you've got uh, this business out for sale? Are there ways of, of cleaning up things and having it all ready? Yeah, so that's that's important. But for both of you, I think I run I ran into it this morning. Um, sellers don't know what's going to be requested of them. Like they're going to ask for at a minimum just the standard stuff, probably three years of bank statements, maybe five, three years of tax returns, maybe five. Your QuickBooks file, um, contracts if they exist, agreements, any litigation. Um, business licenses, um, employee agreement, handbooks, uh, vendor contracts, copies of invoices. It, it, it's an extensive list, even at a small business. So if you don't have those things in order and know what they are, um, you know, I always, I always get, when I go out on an engagement, the sellers always go, well, what do I need to have in line? Or, or a buyer will ask me, what do I need to ask? And I have to kind of go, I can't give you that. That's, that's that guy and that guy. I can't practice law and I can't, and I catch brokers doing it all the time. It's not our job to tell you because we're not fiduciary. Now, part of this per, this video is for you two to go, hey, here's the bare minimum crap. You, you need to have an order when someone yeah. comes to buy your business. So Matt, what are the bare minimum things that a seller should have in order to go to market? Yeah, um, I, I've, I've actually- no, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna cover all of it, right? no, no. no. Give you a quick overview. So I've run into this myself. You know, part of growing our accounting firm is that we bought four firms in the last three years. Mm -hmm. So I've actually the buying side of it and knowing and asking for my own purposes, like what do I want to look at? But if I was selling, obviously you need to have a clean set of books. I mean, the biggest thing that we see when we come in to look at transactions are a set of accounting records where like bank accounts have never been reconciled. When you actually look at the financial statements, they don't have any reflection on the tax return that was prepared. So I would really, really highly recommend that 
you're thinking about selling the business, make sure your books and your tax returns match up. Like that's the first red flag when I'm looking at something, making sure that's the case. And then really having um, your employment records, if you have employees, make sure those are all set out and ready for the for the seller's account or the buyer's accountant to come in and have a look at it. And then also, I think another thing would be when I'm looking at a, at a firm or another company, um, concentration of risk. So I'm looking at what are the largest clients. If you're in a restaurant, you're obviously not going to have that. you got a bunch of people right. running in. Or, but if I'm looking at an accounting firm, in fact, the last one we bought, we found out that there were five clients that make up probably 25% of the business. So we had to dig a lot deeper and find out were there contracts with these clients? You know, are they long-term clients? Are they people that just came in? Are we going to lose these folks? So I think those are the big things that I'm looking at when I'm coming in to buy a company. Yeah, it's funny. I My first appointment this morning was I pulled it. He handed me the tax return and I looked at the QuickBooks and they did not tick and tie. And yeah. then, I, then I went right to the bottom of the tax return and it was a bookkeeping service, not a CPA. And it's a seven million dollar business. And I'm yeah. like, you need to you, you got a problem and your QuickBooks needs to reconcile. And, he, you know, he's like, why? I'm like. Cause you're not a little boy anymore. You're a big business and you need to act like an adult. And yeah. you know, you're here's things that, you know, the guy with the history major spotting and you know, I'm a dummy on accounting, but if I spot it, then there's a whole bunch of things you're screwing up and you need adult representation. To fit. I did give him your name by the way, but you know, um, and Ken, what are they, what are mm -hmm. the things we look at? Well, I'll echo what Matt said and, and add in, um, you know, from a legal standpoint, we want to make sure that, they're operating in a company that's active and, and properly uh, documented in the creation of the company and doing their annual reports. We want to make sure that they're, uh, they're uh, wherever the business uh, premises are, that they have either an active lease or, you know, they own the property and that if they have a lease that it can be assigned. We know that landlords are, are often a very big problem uh, in transactions. So that's an early thing we want to talk about. What does that entail? How long is left on the lease? Uh, yeah, I would stop required? there. Stop yeah. there. Like, like before you ever start a business, you need to have your lease reviewed by counsel and by a broker. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we lose leases constantly because you didn't negotiate up front because the you give all your leverage to that landlord when you come to them and say, I got a buyer. So before you do anything or at renewal time, that's your point of leverage to negotiate better terms. Even if you're three to five years out, you have to think of that exit. So I'm sorry to pump in there on that one. No, absolutely. It's a, it's a critical issue. Um, uh, you, you deal with it every day as, as well as we do. Um, so we, you talked before about permits and licenses. Those are important to understand and, and have those in place. Uh, understand if you're a, if you require your business requires a license from DBPR because you're a contractor or you're, you know, whatever you're doing, does your buyer have that license? Or are they going to need to keep you involved uh, while they operate for some period of time to get that license? And we, you know, we want to make sure that uh, the seller's license is, is available and that they're available to participate, uh, you know, in some, some way going forward to make sure they're covered and, and not doing it or, improper. Or, or redundancy in licensing. So, Hey, there's one HVAC guy. Are there multiple? I mean, we literally in my office had a guy, 10 days from closing and the owner with the license crashed his airplane and died. Mm, so, yeah. you know, what happens to that business? So that whole risk assessment, you need to do that. And, and mm -hmm. like in a real estate brokerage, there should be two licenses. I know Matt's got his brother, right? In your office, there's multiple partners, right? There's always a who hands off, who's on multiple signatures, who's got control of the bank accounts, all these, they're not pleasant discussions, but things happen. Mm -hmm. The longer I do this, the more I see things happening. You know, it's just the nature of the beast. Yep. What about uh, well, I was gonna add on fictitious it, fictitious names. Yeah, I was know? gonna say intellectual property, but fictitious names comes in. Uh, you know, there's a, usually the seller of a lot of these businesses. The sellers have, uh, you know, Acme, whatever company, and the buyer is going to use the Acme name, so they need to be prepared to get a fictitious name to cover it, uh, or if the seller. Uh, has been using a fictitious name, how we're going to transfer that. Usually not not too big of a deal, uh, but general intellectual property, we got to worry about, um, you know, do they have trademarks? Should they have trademarks? 
for things that are being used in the business, because that can, again, be a risk for a buyer if there's no protection on the name or uh, product name or, or whatever is being used. Uh, and it could be patent or trade, pa patent or copyright, depending on, again, the type of business. And so those are things we want to try to make sure are all set up and, and in good standing and ready to go, because that could be a huge part of the valuation for the business. Uh, again, depending on if they're a software company or whatever they're doing. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. it also, those things also help me defend. Like the, the tighter both these things are, the more scarce of a commodity your business is. If your books and records are tight, if if all the legal bells and whistles are in place, that on that other side of the table, there's a guy like Ken or a gal like Ken or a team of people <laughs> who are trying to find something to pick at because they want to earn their fee. And you button all this up, then I have the ability to leverage. I mean, we're watching that right now where I have a scarce resource and my job's to drive the price. I'm going to drive the price because I know I've got a commodity that's tight. Right? Yeah. So I've got good. about, by the way, we got about nine minutes left. So am I forgetting anything on the due diligence front? The only thing else I think I would say is um, one thing that I like to do <clears throat> on the due diligence side, really take a quick look for the office, what the the people are there. I mean, that's a tough one to nail down. Um, we ran into that again on a, on a business that we had purchased where, you know, everybody's bright and cheery when you're looking at it from a due diligence side. And it's, it's a tough thing to, to find out because Many times the sellers don't want the employees to know, obviously, that there's a sale going on. I mean, that that yeah. has happened to us as well. But I think trying to find out the tone of the business is a sort of an intangible thing that, you know, is a good idea to maybe check. And and that's something that maybe even the buyers would want to go in and just take a tour of the restaurant or the office and just yeah. as as a secret shopper almost and find out, hey, what is it really like in there? Is it busy? You know, yeah. what's going on? business yeah there are ways i mean the one the one benefit of social media is people vomit their opinions um once you establish who the people are go look at their social media i mean big corporations do that when they hire they they go look at and vet social media profiles mm -hmm. so you know people are not conscious of what they do they respond in a in a blunt manner and you can look at profiles and customer reviews, profiles, private social media pages, and get an assessment for the culture, personalities, and people you're going to be dealing with. Now, you have to do that in the context of business. You know, yeah. one bad apple doesn't make. Um, but to your point, I was just telling somebody about Menchkite. So, you know, where the Mensch is in Judaism, mm -hmm. right? It's a good guy. There's that stuff between the bricks. That's that's what holds the deal together is that little stuff and a, and a personality is part of it. So if you got someone who's a, you know, a raging Trumpite and they splatter it all over their web page, you know, and they're your 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 face of your company as a salesperson, and you need to assess that. I don't care how you assess it, but you need to assess it on your purchase and and make a, a business decision, you know, or vice versa, you know, how that's going to affect and is that something you want to purchase. Because they come with it, or you just buy it and get rid of them, and that's that's another thing. But then you got to go down the legal path of, all right, how long have I got to eat that person's attitude? <laughs> Can I steer them correctly? And um, do I really have grounds within the employment law to can them? You know, there's all that that avenue of, but don't go too far down that rabbit hole because then my job, I'll never make a living. Um, but I, I think I think the, we do a quick Google search a lot of times of businesses just to see if there's any news out there. I'll do just a quick story. So we were looking at a business that was i think it was delivering oxygen canisters to homes or something and when i did a google search or it might have been home, home health it was maybe home health nurses something like that and just did a google search and one thing that popped up was an article where the the manager of the company was telling i think it was the orlando sentinel we're really concerned because we think that medicare is going to cut our fees in half next year and yeah. so you know when i pulled that up i'm like Geez, that's super scary because this business's revenues yeah. could happen. That was on. Well, on you remember, quick... remember tanning salons used to be a thing, right? Yeah. And then it's like there's regulation. But Ken, you and I had that at Christmas, where mm -hmm. the buyer had had a had a you know a proceeding going against them. I didn't know about it. He didn't think to tell me about it. 
you know, it negated the ability to finance. It was a felony charge. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. But we got through it. We literally got through the process and got, you know, just because there's a charge doesn't mean it's true. We've learned that in the, in the, in this, you know, the, the legal system. So, but you owe it to yourself as a buyer to do a quick Google search and Google will tell you. And by the way, go to the second page. There was, right. I, I was, someone called me yesterday and said, you know, there's a way to suppress pay, you know, inf bad information. And you can do that with some medium posts and, you know, move something to the bottom because let's face it, the government doesn't do SEO for rankings, right? So um, go to the websites and, and can you do that? I mean, sometimes on UCCs, those things will pop, right? They're, char they're right. tied and you could run criminal searches. You could run background checks. Those are all part and parcel of due diligence as well. Yeah, I, I was also gonna throw out, Mike, before we go, the uh, whole insurance realm is another area. We want to make sure, you know, talking to sellers beforehand to make sure they've got their insurance in place and that after the sale, they're going to have some kind of a tail coverage. What does that look like? How much does that cost? Uh, and, you know, from the buyer side, understanding what the insurance requirements are for this business and, and how that's going to work going forward and having that in place uh, before the closing. Yeah. And like we're doing, I think we're doing one now where there's a licensing. We have to make sure that's in place to that the business can continue to operate legally until the buyer secures there. And that's all stuff that kind of your broker needs to identify. The sellers need to explain what they do properly to the council. And the council needs to know all these moving parts to make sure at the time of close, the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Um, Cause you know, yeah, there's the vetting process, but everybody wants to get the deal done. So Matt, any mm -hmm. final words? No, I that? think we pretty of it that, um, that I think I would look at if I was going in to purchase a business and kind of how the whole realm of it works. So Good, good information from both you guys. Okay. So, uh, Ken, how can people get a hold of you? And same with you, Matt. So, Ken, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, yeah, I'm at Moran Kid uh, Law Firm in Orlando. You can uh, look me up. 407-841-4141 is my telephone number. And, uh, you know, glad to help with business transactions. All right. And Matt? Yeah, so the quickest way to find information about us is probably the website, which is hbitax.com. Phone numbers are okay. on there, addresses, and gives you a pretty good overview of our firm as well. Yeah, and if you need to get a hold of them, I have their private numbers, but I'm not giving it out to y'all. So <laughs> yeah, our, secret our, website is, our website's morankid.com, M-O-R-A-N-K-I-D-D.com. All right. Thanks, everybody.